Um, our next speaker is Dr. Stephen Sands. Uh, he earned his doctorate in child and school psychology from New York University and completed his fellowship in clinical neuropsychology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, Dr. Sands is an associate professor of medical psychology in the Department of Pediatrics and Psychiatry at Columbia University Medical Center and is the director of the Valerie Fund uh, Psychosocial Program and co-director of the Center for Comprehensive Wellness. In these capacities, Dr. Sands is a child psychologist who provides mental health services ranging from individual to parent, sibling and family therapy for those patients and families currently undergoing treatment within the pediatric hemonc and stem cell transplantation program at Columbia University Medical Center and Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital of New York Presbyterian. Um, Dr. Sands is also responsible for performing neuropsychological evaluations for pediatric hemonc and stem cell transplantation pa uh, patients as part of the ongoing clinical research studies that evaluate the impact of treatment in addition to providing clinical assessments for those returning to school or those off treatment who may benefit from receiving appropriate educational placement and remedial interventions. And I thought we would lighten it up a little bit here and not get quite a, as heavy in, on the medical side. And Dr. Sands has been here before and I'm very happy that he was able to return. So Dr. Steven Sands. I want to thank Pat and the foundation for inviting me to come back. Um, so today, uh, what I want to do is give you an overview, a pretty broad overview. I have a bunch of slides, and I want to explain to you the, what we've learned in the field in general about the late effects for cognitive, but then social, emotional, behavioral for kids undergoing treatment for a range of cancers. Because if you do a literature search on neuroblastoma, there's uh, an incredibly, uh, incredible scarcity of, of data. So I want to talk to you about what we've learned in the field in general plus what we've been doing to intervene and help for cognitive and emotional behavioral. And then also talk about the role of parents, because as you know, that's uh, quite an important area to assess and intervene as well. So um, what we've made our biggest mark on our kids who've gotten treatment to their central nervous system. So essentially it would be brain tumor patients who roughly 20% of the population who get surgery, chemo, radiation to their brain. Another 30% of kids have leukemia and some, uh, fewer now, get whole brain radiation. But they get intrathecal methotrexate, which passes the blood-brain barrier. Um, uh, but also, you see at the bottom of the slide, can also include high-risk neuroblastoma kids, that, which we'll talk about as well, lymphoma patients who get radiation to their chest, and now there's literature talking about um, limiting oxygen flow to their brain, um, retinoblastoma kids who before got incredible amounts of radiation to their eyes that go back to their brain, um, and others that might have learning issues that may or may not be related to their cancer diagnosis, to also keep that in mind, that not everything always relates back to uh, their diagnosis and treatment. Um, so neurocognitive impairment is, is implicated, again, as I mentioned, in CNS treatments with things like uh, intrathecal uh, or high-dose IV, methotrexate, chemotherapy, as well as steroids, dexamethasone being much more neurotoxic to the hippocampus and other areas than prednisone, but an effective treatment. Um, brain irradiation, those who have OMA, uh, plus those who have OMA who it's delayed two months or more for diagnosis and miss out on early treatment have higher problems. Um, and we can also put in here, which I was thinking as I was sitting, platinum-based chemotherapies like cisplatin, which impact hearing uh, and then uh, impact learning as well. Um, they tend to result in right hemispheric uh, declines, perceptual, nonverbal, visual motor, processing speed, attention. Mathematics tends to be a right hemispheric task as well. People don't know exactly why. It's not a predilection for the right hemisphere, but it has more white matter. And you'll see in a minute, uh, many of these treatments demyelinate and reduce normal appearing white matter. Higher risk groups include those with CNS disease, radiation, younger age, and females in some diagnoses, not all, uh, like leukemia, are at higher risk for lowered verbal IQ and um, aspects of, uh, of functioning. So, Cranial radiation, just to start off with, is the most neurotoxic of all the treatments that, that are offered. Um, physical changes develop over time, not right away. No one comes out of radiation a changed person. There's white matter changes that disrupt uh, in terms of efficient transmission of nerve impulses. There's a, a 
positive correlation between normal appearing white matter and IQ. So the more white matter you have, the higher your IQ is, and conversely as well. Um, damage to blood vessels, focal area of calcification. Um, and I also wanted to just pause for one second to say that it's so inspiring to hear many of the physicians here talking about newer treatments. And I think one caveat I just wanted to be clear is that um, what we're talking about now are treatments that we know that we do. We as a field want to cure as many kids as possible with less toxic treatments and return them to school, hopefully indistinguishable from their peers. But uh, what's inspiring about these new treatments is they hold a lot of promise, but we don't know uh, what the late effects are going to be. So part of my role is to, be, is to document survivorship, that yes, the kids survive, and then how do they do to go back to school, and what can we do to help them transition to get back to school to, to do well. So I just wanted to say that, that the caveat is there's more to learn as well. So in terms of uh, core deficits, it's um, sustained attention concentration. All of us, even now and uh, in our daily life, we space out for a minute, we come back. But kids who've gotten treatment uh, along the lines we just talked about uh, tend to space out and have trouble paying attention for longer periods of time than most of us do. And that's a precursor to learning and memory. If you're not fully attending to what the teacher's saying, you're not going to take in 100% of what's being said. Processing speed, we measure it by paper and pencil tasks in two minutes. But it's not about your, you know, how quickly can your, does your hand work. It's the processing speed of your brain for reading, thinking, solving problems, generating solutions, et cetera. And then fine motor dexterity, if somebody has a cerebellar tumor or, or, or aspects that, that affect fine motor, uh, peripheral neuropathies, et cetera. So because of those three, uh, people's intelligence tends to go down. And again, it's because those areas of processing speed and sustained attention concentration drag it down. Uh, mathematics, we mentioned, is more right hemispheric as opposed to uh, reading, spelling, which is all left hemispheric, discrete units of, of information. Uh, visual learning and memory, visual motor integration, executive functioning, which is a huge piece we'll talk about. So I just wanted to talk about the quality of deficits briefly that many of you know too well, but uh, inattention and distractibility, so requiring repetition, uh, really having trouble uh, working well in a busy classroom, and that's also a lot of kids here who got cisplatin. With the high-frequency hearing loss, um, it's really one-on-one uh, -on -one or a smaller classroom is much easier to hear, but in crowded classrooms, restaurants, uh, a car with a radio on is just uh, completely distracting. Right, uh, it gets disrupted by computers, TVs. The slow rate of information we talked about is failing to finish assignments on time, slow to respond, getting overloaded by too much information at once that most kids have to handle, but, but uh, kids need to be broken down. So you know, I'm, I'm always also trying to figure out who's at highest risk, because not everybody is going to develop these uh, and at the same rate. So if we can swim upstream and figure out who's at highest risk, we can be more proactive at, in finding them, seeking them out early to intervene. So younger age, there is no safe age. Uh, clearly, you know, two, three, four, five, six is much more harmful. Every study that breaks on four, above and below, six, eight is always significant because younger age, no matter what, is a significant factor. Um, higher dose of, of radiation or treatment, uh, in terms of radiation, larger volume, so a focal radiation, it's the same amount as someone who got their whole brain and spine. Uh, those who got the whole brain and spine would do worse off because the volume, the larger volume that bathes in their axis in radiotherapy, for example, would be more neurotoxic than a focal radiation for, for a focal disease, focal tumor. And then longer time since radiation, I think, is really important. And I think it's important for us to explain it to teachers and educators, because we'll dovetail with now, what do we do with this information? But the question was, is it a loss of stored information or the kids failing to keep up? So for educators, when you know, you'll test somebody and they're in the average range, you rarely, if ever, have testing before they got sick, maybe once in a while if someone had you know, ADHD, et cetera. But, but uh, your baseline, so to speak, is really before treatment or right after. So school districts generally say, oh, he or she's in the average range, there's no problems. And then you have to put the literature and, and be really passionate and, and, and uh, consistent in explaining that uh, if you do nothing, that you don't know this child perhaps came from the superior range, the high average range, and now is average. And if you do nothing, just to kids who've never been treated in their life, um, just to stay at uh, IQ of 100, which is the top of the bell-shaped curve, which is you know, solidly within the average range, as they get older, that their raw score has to go up. But kids who have been treated tend to lear learn around 65, 75% of the rate of their peers based on what we were just talking about. So because of that, they're learning. It is positively sloped, but um, they're falling further and further off the curve to explain to educators 
the need for early intervention here to push this curve back up and not wait two, three years later when, when you have much more uh, to uh, ground to, to catch up on. So I wanted to review the few articles specifically to neuroblastoma th that are out there. Um, and a couple of things that are important that you want to look at when you're looking at uh, literature as well is the total number of patients. So this one has 76 patients. They're post bone marrow transplant with high dose chemo and autologous uh, transplant without uh, total body radiation. And means are, can be deceiving because that's an average, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But these are roughly five years post treatment, so there's obviously a range, not everybody's five years. And there were, to, this, to the point of this conference, 46 of them. Were, had neuroblastoma. So their IQ and academic achievement was normally distributed um, compared to the bell-shaped curve. Uh, deafness associated with cisplatin uh, yielded uh, verbal IQ and reading deficits, um, and clearly a problem that we have yet to figure out. I'm doing research now with brain tumor patients also get cisplatin, and we're um, uh, doing a study now with measuring ototoxicity, uh, parent functioning, and kids' uh, emotional and cognitive, because now there are actually a bunch of promising interventions to reduce uh, uh, hearing deficits. Uh, mother's educational level um, was correlated with all IQ, full scale, verbal, and performance, reading and spelling. So as the mother's IQ went up, not the father's, I apologize, I don't know why that happened, but <laughs> uh, went up, uh, IQ reading and spelling went up, and age of bone marrow transplant and length of follow up yielded different attention, memory, and reading profiles. I don't want to break it down more because I have the article if you want to look at it, but there was no clear uh, consensus that you know, younger, younger kids at BMT did worse on certain things, older kids at BMT did worse on other things, those who were further out from treatment improved on some areas and didn't. So I don't think it's a clear issue. We need to better understand the mechanisms, but, but age at treatment, age at BMT is important as well as length of follow-up, how, how far you are out from treatment. The next paper is from 2005 looked at uh, 16 kids, which is quite sparse, um, but an you know, important uh, publication nonetheless, because it's stage three and four neuroblastoma diagnosed at a mean of 2.8 years old with a six-year follow-up on average and tested when they were roughly 8.8 .8 years old. So the mean of the entire group for full-scale verbal IQ and math was above average, and that verbal IQ uh, was higher than performance, which would uh, relate back to what I was saying to you, that right hemispheric dysfunction, um, uh, visual, spatial, social um, cues, uh, mathematics, and that would come into also things like chemistry with helixes, et cetera, things that are nonverbal were, were more problematic. Doesn't mean that kids can't do these things. It means that uh, for many kids it's harder, not that they can't do it. And that more than 50% uh, of these parents were college educated, with, so SES is the highest correlate with uh, overall academic achievement. There's some um, some a tongue-in-cheek comment of show me what's in your parents wallet and I'll tell you how far the kid's gonna go in school but it is a strong correlation which is important because they're saying they're trying to explain why is the group doing so well above average on full-scale IQ and verbal IQ and math and they were saying that perhaps more than half it's because more than half the parents were college educated um, they looked at those who got total body radiation versus no total body radiation regimens preparative regimens for the transplants and the groups were not significantly different those who got myeloblative versus no myeloblative uh, preparative regimen were also not significantly different. Um, and parent and emotional parent reports were, were, um, were actually similar between the groups, um, which just my experience with TBI, uh, a lot of kids who relapse w for diseases like leukemia will get total body radiation as preparative regimen. Some don't. But um, total TBI has much less radiation to their brain. It's, it's spread out to the whole body and yields significant other late effects that are really important in terms of organ functioning, um, but in terms of cognitive functioning, they generally come out of it quite well, um, which is uh, to say that uh, it's much less distributed to the brain. The caveat with that is that um, those who got radiation previously for leukemia and then later get TBI are much worse off, but TBI by itself cognitively doesn't yield generally significant deficits. Um, for the brain, but again, as I said, it's important to notice to note that the other organs are, are at risk. And then the last article uh, came out uh, from a colleague, 2008. They looked at 46 patients uh, were stem cell uh, survivors, 20 months post transplant, around 10 years old. Uh, 14 of which 30% had neuroblastoma. I'm trying to tease apart you know, relevant uh, subcourt subgroups. And then she also looked at 33 siblings to try to look at comparisons. So the two groups, siblings and the transplant survivors overall 
were similar on full-scale IQ, verbal IQ, and performance IQ. Uh, survivors were equal to siblings on reading and math scores. Uh, survivors uh, struggled a little bit more in spelling than siblings, was one of the few findings. Survivors, secondarily, another important one, had lower physical uh, quality of life than siblings, and that's, we're gonna talk in a minute about social, emotional, behavioral, that's uh, critically important. And um, siblings um, actually had, in this study, higher internalizing scores, which are anxiety, depression, et cetera, than survivors. Um, child age, uh, maternal depression and age and family cohesion impacted IQ and academic achievement, and that's actually gonna dovetail nicely with what I'm gonna talk about later with the importance of parental functioning and family functioning. And those with cranial radiation, a diagnosis of neuroblastoma, interestingly, or Hodgkin's, had higher, I'm sorry, their internalizing scores were the same as the siblings. But the whole point is also to say to you that the internalizing was equal, it was equivalent if you had neuroblastoma, but both groups were not clinically significant. So you're saying that, that, that they're equivalent, uh, no longer is siblings higher, but they're both within normal limits. So to, not to lose sight of the fact that, that it wasn't clinically significant. Um, so in terms of interventions, what to do, I wanted to shift gears now into terms of next steps. So it depends on how old a child is. Uh, for primary grades, um, you know, for school, for early identification, and the IEP and the 504 and accommodations, uh, I am certain many of you know you've had to, been at, you've had to be staunch advocates for your child um, because I know that many times parents are concerned about uh, their child doing well, surviving, limiting their distress, and aren't thinking about school issues and accommodations. And hopefully you've received help from your, your medical team and you've had to become adv staunch advocates on your own. But that it's important to spread the news that, and with other colleagues and other families that every single child who gets diagnosed at centers with cancer uh, is able to get a IEP as under other health impaired. Um, many people aren't aware of that, aren't thinking about that. I know 504 accommodations are also helpful to me. What I like about an IEP is it, it's a legal document. It opens up state and federal funds for accommodations, whereas a 504, which is what the school tends to try to divert people into, is roughly a handshake deal, and it's, we'll try to help your child, and it's not legally binding. Um, so I prefer uh, more times than not an IEP that, that's concretized and, and, and it's a legal document. Um, the two parts are the Section 504 of the Americans with Dis Disabilities Act and Public Law 94-142 guarantee due process rights for your child to receive a free and appropriate education in the least restrictive environment. Um, and that the law protects your child, not the school. A lot of times when you go into these uh, meetings at school, they fast talk you and you have no idea that, that you know, it's not what the school is offering, it's what you're willing to accept and what you think is in the best interest of your child. Now you don't have to say yes, you can sign that you attended, you can take time to speak to the psychologist, you can bring a lawyer in, you can appeal, et cetera. And I am quite certain that many of you here, most of you already know that, but, but it's really an important dialogue I have with parents all the time to explain their rights. Um, in terms of adolescence, the behavioral and emotional development is critically important, as well as study skills, organization, and planning. It's hard enough, even kids who aren't sick, to now start to have you know, four different teachers, five different teachers, and long-range projects, and um, requires a lot of time management, study skills, test-taking skills. But kids who've gotten treatment tend to struggle with executive functioning issues, and uh, the dovetails exactly with um, these areas that are challenging. Again, study skills, organization, planning. And high school and beyond, self-advocacy, uh, college. Um, some kids don't go on to college, uh, don't graduate high school, and the GED is a big black box. Once kids turn 18, the schools start to flush them out. Oh, you, you know, why don't you go get your GED? They have no idea how to help them to get a GED, when in fact, a child actually is able to be in public school until they turn 22. Not 21, but until they turn 22. Uh, and then some kids, W uh, would benefit from vocational uh, as well. And the whole idea of picking out a college, every college is, has to provide support services. Uh, some do a better job than others, so it's really important to actually be in good hands with someone who can explain which are the best colleges that would be a good fit. There's no good or bad colleges, obviously. It's which are the best fits for your, your children. So I wanted to also talk about what we're doing as a field in pediatric oncology for interventions. It's one thing to identify issues, uh, and then what are we doing about it? And this is the infancy stage. We're learning and trying our best. There are a couple of barriers, and I wanted to discuss them with you. So essentially, there's two types of interventions. One is behavioral, and one would be pharmacologic. So behavioral would be things like cognitive remediation programs, 
um, physical exercise, which we'll talk about, pharmacologic would be medications like methylphenidate, also known as Ritalin, uh, Provigil. Uh, metformin is something we're not going to talk about today because it's uh, off-label and it's um, in its infancy stage. Um, uh, so for computerized cognitive training, the, the advantages are that uh, you wouldn't have to come into the clinic. Uh, you could work at home and it's um, computer adaptive, so as good as you get, it starts to challenge you more and more as opposed to being stagnant. Uh, kids like the screen time. Disadvantages are that it's not currently well studied and it's expensive if you're not in a, in a research study. One such program is CogMed, which is kind of like um, Lumosity, except designed for kids. It goes down to four to seven. There's 25 sessions, 15 minutes each, uh, eight activities, predominantly, as you can imagine, visual short-term memory and working memory um, to improve that as the gateway to improving your learning and memory. If you can sustain your attention concentration and, and keep thinking and working, uh, that, that, that would be a precursor, as we mentioned. The, Version 7 to 17, also 25 sessions, about five weeks, uh, 30 to 45 minutes each, 12 activities, same domains, and you get you call up the family on the phone and coach them and make sure that you know you um, work with the parents to to make sure the kids are, are completing it. So I wanted to just say that these studies uh, are helpful. There's two things to look at. One is near transfer. So it's how do kids who do s studies like this, how do they do on things that we're going to test them, like where a digit span is where I say numbers forwards and you repeat them back to me, um, and they get longer and longer until you can't hold it in your, in your memory. But FAR transfer is much more important. FAR transfer is how is your child doing in school now? Are they paying better attention in school, as opposed to another test that assesses that domain? So I wanted to show you uh, two th a few things. One is for c computer based intervention in oncology, it's mostly focused on brain tumor and leukemia so far. Um, and uh, Christy and some other people, Heather, um, you know, the ends are nine. We talked about looking at numbers, 23, 20, 60. The goal here is 60, and it's under accruing now. Um, but uh, again, these are the populations we talked about, Lumosity, CogMed, CogMed. So a few things. This is the compliance. So most people finish it, so they enjoy it, so that's good news. Uh, the near transfer, meaning we t other s tests that we do, these kids improve on tests of sustained attention, concentration, and working memory. FAR, again, me is much more important. How does my child do in the classroom? So if they're mixed. And mixed doesn't mean that they did or didn't. It means that some do and some don't. So it can work for some people, but it's not a home run. It's a step in the right direction. Physical exercise is fascinating. Um, it's such a simplistic concept, but really important because many cancer treatments uh, radiotherapy in particular, but not exclusively, are thought to exert uh, neurotoxic effects through suppressing cell proliferation, like reduced hippocampal neurons and frontal cortex glial cells, and they reduce the potential for neuroplasticity in the existing brain circuitry, and exercise is known to support cell proliferation and is well established for promoting a neural environment that's amenable to plasticity, and the references there. Um, so a colleague up at um, Sick Kids in Toronto had uh, survivors playing, of course, in hockey, uh, Canada floor hockey, uh, but three times a week, and they, you know, broke a sweat. It wasn't vigorous and outrageous. Um, but what I thought was fascinating are two things. One, on tests of attention and memory, they improved. But also, they did imaging, and the hippocamp, the size of their hippocampus continued to grow, matching the healthy controls, and continued after the exercise was over. Um, so it, it's critically important to appreciate the impact of exercise three times a week for three months on their pre and post memory scale testing as well as their brain uh, size and functioning. And um, compliance can be challenging. You know, the idea of fatigue is um, uh, not an apt word. Kids don't want exercise when they don't feel well. It makes complete sense. Um, but uh, so that's been one challenge. But I think that um, it holds a lot of promise. In terms of medication, methylphenidate and Ritalin was used started about 15 years ago with this population, 45% of pediatric oncology kids respond and benefit as compared with 75% of ADHD kids. So that's telling you right off the bat that the kids who go through treatment, their brains are clearly different and not the same, but it can be, just like the uh, computer-based, effective for some people, but not all. Those you whittle down who does it benefit to, uh, males particularly uh, benefited more, kids who were older at treatment, kids who displayed more ADHD symptom symptoms at uh, uh, prescription, less neurologically compromised and higher IQ were often predictive of those who had a positive response. 
And I also wanted to talk to you about modafinil, which we just finished a study through Children's Oncology Group uh, to improve neurocognitive deficits. And this is for brain tumors, but it doesn't have to be. This is the population we started with. Um, so I just wanted you to appreciate that this is provigil, and it uh, impacts the sleep-wake center of the brain as opposed to uh, amphetamines and methylphenidate, which impact other areas uh, as stimulants. This is not a stimulant. Um, it's for narcolepsy initially. It binds the dopamine transporter and inhibits the reuptake as modest activity, um, improves uh, wakefulness, well tolerated, and um, it helps kids uh, stay more vigilant, um, have more energy, more focus throughout the day. Um, here's the objective. Also, we talked about barriers, promises, and barriers. So the barriers here were that 57 sites out of around 250 opened the study. 27 sites enrolling, which is a, a much smaller than, than COG can handle, 95 enrolled, 86 were randomized. That means 90% of the kids who got enrolled met criteria because you have to get screened in. Um, so it's clearly a problem. Um, and uh, parents tend to, and I understand the rationale when you call parents, they say, thank you, but my child's been on so much treatment, I don't want him or her on anything else. Um, it's ch frustrating because you feel like they'd have to be screened in, so they'd only be offered this if they have attentional problems, and it's a five-week study, but that's another barrier in terms of parents understandably not wanting to expose their child to any other medications after treatment. Um, so I wanted to summarize the cognitive intervention part by saying that we don't fully yet understand what we should be uh, working on. Is it attention, memory, processing, speed, academics? These are potential areas. Most all the work has been on attention, <laughs> concentration so far. We also don't know when, what's the best timing, during treatment, right after, or in survivorship. You would think conceptually earlier is better, but there's a study through St. Jude Consortium where they're doing exercise and uh, um, CogMed uh, basically on treatment, and unfortunately the kids are just too tired and they really can't uh, attend and do it well, so perhaps there is a too early, but we have to figure out when is the opportune time. And then also, what components? So is it computer-based, pharmacologic, exercise, parent training? Because as you started to see, you know, 49, 50% or mixed means that not, there's not one treatment for everybody, that there's some people who will respond better to one or the other or combinations thereof. And then also, who do we include? Do we include medical staff? Do we include parents? Do we include school staff? And school staff is interesting because if the exercise is important, a lot of kids who uh, go through treatment are on restricted physical education. So perhaps they shouldn't be sitting on the bench. Maybe they should be doing yoga, exercise, something that's in implemented throughout the school districts to get them moving in a safe way to get their heart rate up. Uh, so that would be an, for an example of, of an intervention that could be done through school. I didn't want to just talk about neurocognitive. I wanted to also talk about psychosocial and quality of life. And I wanted to say that most studies, uh, happily, show that kids who go through treatment, when they get back into school, are, as we talked about, indistinguishable from their peers that um, by parent report, teacher report, self-report, they show good adjustment, psychological measures, and have few emotional and behavioral problems. Um, unfortunately, it's not everybody, as you can imagine and well understand, that it doesn't include brain tumor patients because of physical effects, uh, organic phys uh, psychological problems. So this slide was I had made originally for brain tumor patients, but that was saying that roughly half do well, but half actually don't do well, that they have social deficits, they're isolated, they're withdrawn, but it's not, yeah, right, so this slide is more um, um, relevant, that in addition to brain tumor patients, there's roughly 10 to 20 percent who suffer long-lasting social-emotional problems and display trauma-related psychological distress and deficiencies in social competence that results in isolation from peers. So as you can imagine, it's a lot of times the impact of physical late effects or functional impairments that lead to lower psychological adaptation that they, that they dovetail together. So brain tumor, bone tumors, insults to CNS, and clearly growth hormone, endocrine difficulties, vision difficulties, hearing, the neuroblastoma patients uh, experience uh, really get in the way of running around on the soccer field, going to the mall, hanging out, and uh, driving, uh, and then become less independent and, and more withdrawn. Uh, the patterns tend to be more inter internalizing, we just talked about anxiety, depression, uh, being withdrawn, as opposed to externalizing, which would be you know, breaking windows, being, you know, being oppositional, running, running amok. So uh, being more withdrawn, socially isolated, um, som uh, somatization, physical issues, uh, lowered leadership abilities, lowered self-esteem, and lowered intimacy with peers. 
And I wanted to put in a few slides about parents. We've started to do research on the role of parents that, that really predicts a lot of how the kids are going to do, not just uh, in, not uh, social, emotionally, but also cognitively. And what we've come to realize so far is that high levels of parental, uh, especially maternal, so guys, you, now you don't feel so bad, right? Because that's not just the IQ. It's like the parent, it's the mom's distress, right? Not yours. Um, uh, maternal distress and family dysfunction, like lower cohesion, excessive control, are associated with increased behavioral, emotional, and social difficulties for sure. Plus, uh, perhaps cognitive difficulties are also aligned with uh, family functioning. And that because of that, parents buffer the impact of stressful in, uh, experiences on their children with parental coping and better family functioning, explaining some variance in psychological adaptations. This is really important because if, in fact, we can clarify this, and we're starting to, this has been borne out with traumatic brain injury kids uh, for the research, but uh, with cancer diagnosis, if we can accurately detect the differences, uh, and I'll talk about it in a minute, this is something we can intervene on. We can't change the medical protocols up front, we can't say, oh, don't give them this medication because they're on a treatment protocol. But if we are able to suss out who is high, at higher stress, uh, then we can uh, swim up, meet them, work with them on developing skills in terms of how to cope with, with the distress and, and then have an impact downstream. So in other words, it's modifiable. It's something we can intervene with early. So I just want to summarize that there have been a handful of studies, about two or three nationally, that have done randomized studies on cognitive behavioral therapy for parents of kids who are either newly diagnosed with cancer or undergoing, uh, we were involved with one with parents who are undergoing, um, their kids are undergoing stem cell transplant. Um, so what happens is the kids, the parents who go through the treatment, compared to those who don't, uh, benefit uh, uh, particularly single mothers, those with high levels of depression and anxiety at baseline, and among the bone marrow transplant caregivers, those kids who develop graft versus host disease. And that the trends over time, though, it's elliptical, meaning that they come back together again about a year later, that the people who didn't get the intervention start to improve, and then the, the group that got the intervention, they, they, it's elliptical and they come back together. And it makes me start to think, all right, so should, what, what's the story there? Does it mean that we shouldn't do anything because a year from now they're all going to be fine? And I think partly the answer is no, because um, during that year it could be predictive of how that year goes, but also there could, could set into motion problems for the kids during that year. It's not that uh, it's okay that they come back together a year later. But also, more importantly, that's at a group level. And uh, I just finished, I just got accepted for, for publication uh, study that um, looked at parents who did not get anything. They were the, the, uh, you know, the group that did not get the intervention, just to look at their trajectory over time. And it, closely parallels another study from St. Jude that comes out with three groups of parents. Um, the first group of parents start off with assessments of anxiety, depression, stress, et cetera, roughly 60% of them, low levels at the beginning and uh, low levels the whole time. Then there's a second group of parents with high levels of distress that decline over time, uh, roughly 30%, and then 10% start out high and stay out, whoa, sorry, <laughs> as, as for the drama, sorry, start high and remain high the entire time. And to me, a couple of things, that is clearly, clearly, clearly the group we have to look at. Not that the whole group comes back together down the line, but who are these people? How do we pick them out from this group, right, because these start out high and, and come down, but how do we pick these people out early to intervene with them? Because it's absolutely distressing to them, upsetting to their families. Um, and then um, this group is clearly seems to be resilient in terms of uh, going through the experience, but this group could also benefit. So if we er identify these people early, we'll have time uh, to uh, spend with this group to work with them as well, as opposed to waiting till the, the bottom group you know, starts. We're just running around putting out fires all the time, and then we have no time for any other uh, group. Um, so the last uh, slide, I believe, in here is um, that uh, this really um, argues for the, impl impl uh, the implementation of quick screening tools that we're working on, that we actually use at our site, that predict parental and family risk factors like significant stress, poor coping, emotional or behavioral difficulties, as well as limited financial and social. So it's not just about financial. There's so many other aspects to stress, coping, emotional difficulties. Uh, it's the uh, PAT, the parent uh, assessment tool. It's on the iPad. All new uh, parents get it. We score it, looks at risk factors, we distribute it among the psychosocial team, we distribute it to the physicians. Because the goal is to identify at-risk parents and families at the time of diagnosis for early interventions, to maximize our resources so we can really focus on those who, uh, who need our help the most, 
and minimize current levels of stress and long-term psychological and cognitive effects of the medical treatment. So I appreciate your listening, and I uh, wanted to make sure you had a uh, broad overview, and I'm happy to answer whatever questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sands. Thank you. Um, is there value is with, the, with those last three groups that you showed? Is there is there value with um, creating forms of accompaniment and creating some advocacy between uh, and like by intermixing some of those parent groups? Say like letting letting some of the low stress parents rub off on some of the high stress or, or more distressed parents. It just seems like there. A bazillion variables associated with all of it as well, mm -hmm. considering like just the treatment experience of the child, whether they have every problem under the sun versus not, and then educational levels of the parents before mm -hmm. versus after, you know, temperament, everything. Right. I, I think it's an excellent idea. We, we run a parent group every Thursday, and um, the heterogeneity of the group I think is really, really helpful. I always say to them, it doesn't matter that. Uh, you, know, you have a son, you have a daughter, one's 10, one's you know, 16, one's 5, one has a different diagnosis than the other. It's just about being in the hospital, taking care of your, ch your sick child that brings you guys together to support you, you guys in ways that we are not able to. So I completely agree with you. I do like the idea of mentorship. Um, it would have to be um, those parents whose children are off treatment for you know, five years or whatever time you come up with, and they're, they're screened but also support it throughout the process because it is difficult. But I really think that we have a family council at the Children's Hospital, um, and a parent council, rather. And I think that's an excellent idea. I think it's we do try to connect both kids who've gone through treatment with other kids and parents. Um, but to concretize it would be great. And, and I think taking a step back about all the other variables you talked about, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a clear believer in that people bring, their, people bring their strengths and weaknesses to any situation, whether it's a wedding, a funeral, a bar mitzvah, a cancer diagnosis. So people don't tend to change. They might just fall down for a minute and get back up for an adjustment disorder. But generally, uh, the resilience of the majority of this population is so fascinating. That's what, one of the things I love about this work, of the, the resilience of the kids and the parents. Um, but, and then when people are having difficulties, you, you kind of rewind the tape for a minute, and, and these kids who are biting the nurses or kicking tend to sometimes have these issues previously, and parents as well. So I, I want to try to find these kids and parents earlier on so we can let everybody else know, and we can um, you know, intervene and, and then save time for those in the middle group that often get overlooked. Next question. Okay. Mine is not really a question, but a request. Uh, at, back home, I am an advocate for uh, children with special needs and actually go to IEP meetings with parents as an advocate. And what I would like to do is be able to get information from you, you know, after the meeting's over, that I can carry to our county uh, superintendent of education to present this, to include this in our um, school system. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for very much for your work. We just got funding at Columbia to hire an educational liaison. And uh, I know that job, people whose work doesn't get reimbursed often don't get hired. But uh, the educational liaison role, uh, there are two in New Jersey, and we're going to uh, set up one in, at Columbia. Their job is to full time three areas. One is at diagnosis to support them in making sure they get the right services. And they have, have you seen the Vigo? There are these uh, robots actually are in the classrooms that the kids can actually operate and go through to the classes and it goes down the hallway and they can ask questions and see. Um, and then also kids who are going back to school. We just started um, uh, another time point, not the survivorship visit, but we're backing it up to end of treatment visit, which will be six months prior to ending treatment, so that we can either test them or get the school to test them, because and, and, we need lead time. You can't just say, oh, so-and-so's off treatment. We need to know ahead of time and explain to them about the late effects clinic and what they may expect. And then lastly, kids who are out already off treatment who may have fell through the cracks and didn't get the services or um, have problems unrelated, perhaps, but, but that's another group of kids who, who, who so that the education liaison full-time will uh, meet with them and actually go out into the fields and, and, and support these parents in, in terms of making sure the IEPs match up and that these kids it's incredible, and I'm speaking to you, but I'm talking to everyone in the audience, that for the IEP, for example, if you don't say anything, your child will be, get, be tested every three years. But you could say, um, I want my child tested every year, if you want, and you, sh and you should do that, or every two years. We can, you know, it depends on the situation, how, ch how old the child is. And that, uh, again, we talked about if 
the school saying, oh, we don't do this, we don't do that, we don't do that. That's, not, that's clearly not true. And, and the parents' rights in terms of you know, going to, to, to in front of a judge, an independent judge. Um, so I agree, there's so many aspects to this that, that are critically important. So now, it's Education Liaison is a new type of, of job that's coming out. But uh, thank you for everything you do. Well, I live in a, a rural community and funding is an issue. Mm -hmm. So most of the work I do is, is a volunteer. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it's greatly needed to be incorporated with the other things we already do. 100%, because I completely agree that parents are, you know, want to minimize the stress of their child and aren't thinking about a year from now, my child going back to school, what grade should he or she be in, what type of classroom, what type of services. All right, so thank you for your work. So my question is also related to IEP 504. Um, my son finished treatment last summer, right before he began kindergarten. Um, he had his neuropsych evaluation one year po post um, stem cell transplant neuropsych evaluation. Um, so we got kind of a jump start on, you know, he's, he's got the hearing loss, so we've got that going for us. The other health impaired, everything kind of kind of went to our school with that. Um, he's still. Our school is very supportive. We still don't have one set up for him. Um, we kind of went into it as let's do an evaluation and see what he needs. Um, and I felt like we kind of, our kindergarten year was a honeymoon year, I guess, of going to school. He had kindergarten in the morning, came home and sacked out, took a nap every day after kindergarten. Now we're getting to like, you know, first grade, all day school. Um, and, and he did receive services all throughout the year with speech therapy and, and such. So, so we didn't get, you know, there wasn't lacking in, in his needs. Um, but we still don't have anything set up. So I don't know, like, how's the best way, or I guess still what's the best avenue as far as IEP or 504? Like you said, the 504 is more of like a handshake. We're not obligated to do it versus an IEP is more legally binding. And, and, and you said they, they get funding for it. Is that, I mean, is that something that, I, I don't understand why they would shy away from that unless they're required for the funding or I guess right. I don't, or right. yeah. No, I understand what you're saying. So conceptually, uh, um, they get funding in a lump sum. So the more people who go into special ed, the, the whittles down their lump sum of money. Okay. Um, and I think the services should line up with the neuropsychological testing, which again is looking for strengths mm -hmm. as well as weaknesses. It's not just, you know, and everybody has strengths and weaknesses. There's nobody who's perfect at everything, no one who messes up, everyone has peaks and valleys. So that's why the current assessment is important. And in your case, not just the IQ and academic achievement, but speech and language, occupational therapy, physical therapy, adaptive technology. So with those in hand, to go right then to go to the meeting and, and, and talk about do these match up. And in my mind, for example, once a week of anything is generally not helpful. It should be a minimum of two to three times a week. So there's different touch points. Mm -hmm. And again, the due process rights uh, protect your child. And then also the size of the group. Sometimes they'll put them in eight to one or four to one. And four to one can be okay, but you also wanna mix it up with one to one time. Mm -hmm. And then I'm painting with broad strokes, but um, the other idea is, which I think is really helpful many times is, uh, first of all, you don't have to prove that the school messed up and didn't meet your child's needs. You have to just demonstrate that they're not able, capable to meet your child's needs moving forward. And then the next step or generally can be private school, like a learning disabled school where they're fantastic teachers who are well-trained, young, come in early, stay late, have a ton of resources. Like for example, the FM Buddy uh, unit is helpful, but uh, so I've been in many classrooms that have uh, speakers on the side of the wall so everybody you know, yeah. can hear more that's, clearly. That's currently what our school has. Right. Um, in his, there's actually four kids in his grade that all have hearing aids, so they've, now they've Excellent. left them all in one classroom so that they can have a classroom FM system and benefit the whole class, but I guess also probably save on, I don't know. Right. I don't know exactly, but, um, but it's been working out. Um, but yeah, so, so and, it, and really, like, he's been proficient in most everything. His literacy struggles. I mean, he's just out of kindergarten. I'm, you know. My other kids struggled with literacy at that point. Right. Um, but yeah, like as we go forward, I mean, I kind of want to be proactive as far as, you know, getting something set up so that when he does need that extra help, that then we're not, you know, dragging months on of trying to get something set up or it's trying to, right. you know, so. I, I agree with you. So I think, for example, one is to have him assessed every year. Okay. I'm happy to um, look at those assessments and, and, and talk to you and help you with that. 
because um, you, you know, want to be on top of that. And then uh, we talked about the private school possible opportunity, and there was one other thing I was thinking about with that. Oh, right, so for literacy, you know, schools will have you know, their reading for reading groups, whatever, but uh, Linda Mood Bell and Orton Gillingham are the two bona fide, well-researched and, and established uh, programs to help kids learn how to read. So you can also get a related service provider, or you can get funding for to, to your child to be seen by a specialist outside the school, Okay. You know, for example, for you and everyone else, that doesn't have to be only at the school. And even if, again, for everyone here, if you're in a, a parochial school, day, Jewish day school, Catholic school, they either push in, they have uh, public school staff, or your child will go to a public school, or you can get someone in the community. So it's hard right now in this forum to elucidate every aspect. It really depends on your child's profile. And I'm happy to help you. And the, the neuropsychologist who tested your child also, uh, uh, I'm sure, is happy to help. And And lastly, it's unfortunate, but it's true that for these private school funding issues, it's not about who needs the services the most. It's about bringing a lawyer, an educational advocate, into the meeting to demonstrate that they failed to dot an I, cross a T, which is what promulgates, you know, mm -hmm. gets the funding going as opposed okay. to general need. But you also need to be well equipped. Okay. All right. And staunch. A couple more questions. Um, could you talk about uh, siblings a little bit? Because when we were in treatment, we had always heard that siblings are the ones that are actually the most affected emotionally and behaviorally. And that was certainly our experience as well. Right. That's an excellent uh, question. A uh, Meru study from Toronto Sick Kids did show that the siblings were higher in internalizing uh, issues than, than the patients. And there are a couple of sibling programs um, that we intervene with uh, that we have. But it's really an underserved population. And at our hospital, we have a sibling program at the Child Life area for th from three to six every day and on the weekends. Um, but it's um, something that's really, really difficult. Uh, the program we used had things like um, there'd be planted questions like, oh, so and so is upset because they know ma, um, mom's paying so much attention to their brother and sister. What would you tell them? And these kids open up these letters and say, oh, I'd tell them that. You know, it's it's okay. Your mom loves you. She just has to be with so, you know uh, Johnny because Johnny needs her more now. But she'll be back home. But um, those programs are few and far between. The research is minimal. Maru, uh, I was talking about, uh, has done some research on SIBS. Um, it, it's you're hitting a nail on the head. It's a really important area that's understudied, and also the interventions are. You know, maybe we do that intervention once every year, once every two years. It's it's uh, unfortunate, and I completely agree with you. And many parents. If they're fortunate to, ha fortunate to have two parents in the home, at least, you know, it tends to be the dad. I always talk to parents about for, uh, trying to sw set up a calendar of expectations so the kids at home can see, well, things change, but in two days, mom should be home. And it's also important to switch so that the child in the hospital doesn't become overly reliant on one person. And, um, but um, uh, many other parents that we have in the hospital are single parents, and it's a juggling act, and it's really uh, even more chaotic. Uh, when you come from, you know, uh, minimal support from neighbors, friends, family, economic support. So it, it's, it's, it is really, really challenging. And I wish I had a, a better answers for you. Um, it, it's uh, lastly uh, just understudied. And, and, um, but uh, I'm hoping that it probably, I'm hoping that it, it um, uh, galvanizes or comes together with the family functioning, the parent stress, the family functioning, the, and the resilience, that that kind of picks people up. But as everyone here knows, you know, people change, and I, there, there's a bunch of people talking about post-traumatic growth, but a whole new bunch of people, and I'm in that camp of post-traumatic growth, in terms of how it changes you for the better and how, you know, it really brings people closer. Um, we heard yesterday from a survivor who talked about how it's changed his life. So th there's both aspects, is what I mean to say. It's, it's, it's um, distressing during treatment and then afterwards, but um, I, I wish I had a better answer. I apologize. Okay. One more question. Uh, everything you spoke about here today um, has a devastating impact on families and the children. And I, I've been a consumer of, of cancer products in the industry for 15 years. And I would really like to see what you just did here today, put it in a pamphlet form, expand on your presentation, and your presentation could be of tremendous value placed in critical places, such as the social worker at a uh, at an oncology at a hospital that uh, who now welcomes the family to the entire process and then having a pamphlet what you've just covered here would have a huge impact and, and, and a positive uh, ro provide a roadmap for uh, things that I 
you know, I've been at this for 15 years, and what you talked about are extremely valuable. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. Um, you just jarred my memory. I will now in the future put up a, a, a link on, the, on there. Um, I'm on the Behavioral Science Committee at Children's Oncology Group, the steering committee, mm -hmm. and um, the Pediatric Blood and Cancer just came out with 12, published 12 psychosocial standards of care for kids undergoing treatment, and it ranges from sibling, parent support, uh, neuropsych testing. There's 12 different articles in pediatric blood and cancer that just came out in the last six months. So I would love to um, you know, take credit for all this, but um, I think that uh, there's actually eloquent articles that uh -huh. came out that, that I would encourage people to look at with a link. But um, yeah, and we also videotaped this uh, today, so perhaps that would well, go. Well, I'm, I'm just thinking as a parent, Right. You give them one pamphlet talking about an expanded version of your presentation here today that would be much and more critical than, than maybe the parents who are entering this horrible process may you know, take a while before they ever come across someone like uh, what you've talked about today. Right. So I would, a pamphlet, I, I would be very helpful. Sure. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate that and I'm happy to look into that. I would be honored to do that. Thank you. No other questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sanders. Thank you very much. Okay. We're going to go ahead and take a 15-minute